given that you teach people how to tune, how to calibrate EFI engines, what would you say is one of the uh, biggest misconceptions out there in the market with actually tuning an engine? So I would say that my opinion is that more people than not assume that tuning is some kind of black magic and that only uh, certain special guru people get to know what it is and everybody thinks that like I have to do it the way so-and-so does it because well they won last weekend or they were the world champions last year and so obviously that must be the right way to do it. When my approach has always been that tuning should be much more a science and a craft that we can prove out, right? So I always use the, the difference between like religion and science where um, with a religion, if let's just say you were a religious guy and I'm a religious guy, you might be, I don't know, a, a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Mormon and I might be a Catholic or a, or a Baptist. The reality is we could argue all day long from our different perspectives and never change the other one's you know belief system because with religion, it's impossible to prove. And so it requires this like choice to believe something that I can't prove. A bit of a black magic. A black magic. Whereas what I always tell my students is that the truth doesn't really require your belief. It's still true whether you like it or not. And so with science, science is a system of proving and, and truthing things out. And so everything that we do in our school is based on science so that I can tell you something in the classroom and you can either prove it or disprove it with your calculator, with your laptop, or out on the dyno, or ultimately on the racetrack. And so I think the more that people get out of that misconception that tuning is a, is a black magic, and that you just have to be good or you have to be lucky at it, the better off they'll be if they start approaching it with a more scientific mindset. What do we have here, Ben? Looks like a, looks like a honing machine. Yes, uh, this is what we refer to as the machine of sorrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because- I'm Sorry I asked. Uh, yeah, exactly. Before we had this, uh, we simply just didn't know any better. Okay. And so one of the most critical points for us in our engine prep work is the, the cylinder hone, the bore. Um, getting it perfectly straight and around and getting the texture the way we need it is nearly impossible without a machine like this. So why is that so important? Well, because basically what happens is as you get the thing running, your rings have to conform to the cylinder wall. So the more straight the cylinder wall is, the more round the cylinder wall is, the less bending and flexing that ring has to do as it goes up and down the bore and the better it can seal. So any explosion we make through combustion that we don't seal with the rings is lost power. So okay. We, um, we struggled early on in the program to get consistency. Um, things would happen and you go, well, I don't know, that's better, but I don't know why. Or man, this is terrible, what'd we do wrong? And we found that we would go uh, back to the machine shop and you'd get like the, I don't know, that's the way we always do it, we've never had any problems, you know, the typical sort of defensive result you might expect. And so eventually just through frustration, we ended up saying, let's just invest. And um, so even though we're like an engine shop, we don't do all of the machining operations here because, for example, since our students work on the same engine all the time, the thing that we do the most is we assemble it, we run it, we take it back apart, and normally you need to put new rings and hone it. But I don't always need to deck it or line bore it or you know heavy duty machining operations, so we don't do a lot of that here. We can send that out, and it's easy to measure those dimensions and see what we got, right? When it comes to cylinder bore preparation, um, it's probably the most, and I hate to use this term, but it's probably the most artistic of all of the operations we do. And what I mean by that is uh, the science is still so new that we're learning, uh, we've learned a ton, but we're still learning as we go and our preparation keeps getting better and better. But without a machine like this to be able to control it and measure it and monitor it, we just wouldn't be able to do that. So in the spirit of not dropping some knowledge bombs, sure. give me some knowledge bombs on the, the hone itself. How does the hone make a difference to Power. Okay, so as I was talking about, obviously you need a cylinder bore that has dimensionally accurate, you know. That, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. It's parallel, straight up and down, it's Can't seal the ring. So the thing is, um, we also need to control the amount of oil on the cylinder wall to a very precise level because oil does a couple things. It supports the load that the piston and the rings are putting against the cylinder wall. It lubricates right. those lubricates. parts yep. so they don't yep. fail. Um, and then we also have to be able to use that oil and then get rid of it with the rings that are scraping the oil off the wall. So if I have a cylinder wall that doesn't retain enough oil, because you know, you think about the crosshatch. If you were to look at that under a microscope, you'd have these peaks and valleys. Those valleys are a reservoir that's holding oil. If I don't have enough there to lubricate my parts, they burn up. And so that's, is that the purpose of the hone is to actually hold oil to lubricate the bore. Absolutely. Okay. So we have three components of the 
of the hone, as you call it, or the texture we like to call the profile. Yep. We use a tool that's called a profilometer or a profile o meter. Okay. Profilometer. And it's yep. this tiny little diamond tip stylus that we just scratch along our cylinder wall and it measures down to the millionth of an inch and it draws a picture of the shape of those peaks and valleys. Okay. So what we get interested in then is the difference between the highest peaks and the lowest valleys and the average cross section across the middle because okay. that's our load bearing capacity that's holding that oil. Okay. All right. So if I don't have enough oil, I burn out my pistons. If I have too much oil, then it contaminates on top of the piston and gets into my combustion process and all that. So the thing is, not only does the texture matter, but the cross hatch or the angle matters. Because what happens is traditionally you'd have an angle that was 45 degrees. Yep. And that was just the way we did it. Yep. What we found is as, you know, earlier I was showing you those really tiny rings. Yeah. Well, they're a lot more sensitive to motion. And so if my cross hatch is really steep, then it tends to make that ring want to corkscrew and rotate down the cylinder wall. Yep. That, that hurts sense. my ring seal. The problem is it's good for my oil control because it leaves a vertical path for that oil to drain down so and get rid of it. flow down. The bigger the angle, the more oil flows down. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So I have this trade-off between, well, my oil control is really good, but my ring control is terrible. So we start flattening it out. If I made them parallel, my ring control is awesome. My ring, you know, seals right. up and it doesn't move, but my oil control sucks because I can't get it off the cylinder wall fast enough. Got it. So effectively, you've got the angle of the hatch, uh -huh. which spins the ring in, in, the, in the piston. Yep. If that's flat, no spinning, no spin. real good seal. Absolutely. But the oil has no way to drain. Correct. And so we're left with this problem of, well, what's the right thing for the right application? And weird, weird question. Did that change versus, say, a V engine, V8, where you're on an angle, versus, say, an upright engine? Would you change the angle of the... So um, I've, I'm not 100% sure of the answer to that because the science is still so new. But I, interestingly, I've been asking friends of mine that do horizontally opposed engines, and we seem to get very similar answers and results. So. Um, the truth is, I don't know. The, the, the good news is I know how to find out. So maybe it's more to do rather than the oil actually running down. It gets scraped down. Absolutely. You yeah. know, as you're trying to it's push it, it's not gravity that's pulling it down. On. It's actually the, the, the ring that pulls it down. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's just it's an easier path for it to travel yeah. along. And yeah. that's the direction that the, the piston is moving down. Uh -huh. yeah. It wants the oil to go that way. The question is how hard is it for it to move that direction? Yeah. What about things like the, the block itself, say the hardness of the material, or whether it be a, a sleeve or whether it be... Um, cast iron block or whatever. Aluminum block, block. Yeah, yeah. Aluminum so block. huge, huge difference in the way that we have to prepare the, the block. We, we want to end up with the same finish for the same application. The problem is though, depending on the hardness of the block or if it's aluminum, the thickness and the hardness of the cylinder, when I take these stones, I'm basically grinding the cylinder wall. They're rotating around yeah. and they're, you know, well, that's grinding. That's the point of it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The problem is if I push too hard on the cylinder wall, I can distort it. Okay, yep. Okay, so like an aluminum block, if I put a lot of stone pressure in there, I can have the same grit stone, yep. but at higher pressure, and I'll get a, a texture of my cylinder wall that looks great, but I measure it and it's not round. It's like, you know, kind of like elongated a, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's okay. pushed out wherever the cylinder wall is the thinnest, yep. it'll have the greatest dimension. So that hurts my ring seal. Um, but on the other hand, if I use that same you know, methodology in a really hard race block, let's say like a typical NHRA Pro Stock uses what's called CGI, that's compacted graphite iron. Okay. And they are the worst thing in the world to try and machine because they're hard. Right. Um, and so you end up having to use a completely different honing procedure to get the same texture than you would on even a regular cast iron block or even an aluminum block. So okay. we have to actually experiment and measure the profiles that we get for each block type. And then what we do is we save a program in the machine. So if I'm doing a RHS aluminum race block, I use a different program than I would for say like a dark, uh, you know, high, high hardness block. So we talked a little bit, we've talked about the, the, the piston ring itself. Yep. Um, does that make a difference to the hone? Do you have to match those up somehow? Sure, yeah. So if you think about it, the bigger the ring is, let's say I got a pro mount engine with a big thick top ring because yep. there's a lot of heat, a lot of temperature. Like a turbo engine would have a big uh, top. Yeah, let's, let's, great. Let's talk about a turbo methanol powered engine. Yep. So because it makes tons of power, I should assume there's tons of heat. If there's tons of heat, you create power, right? there you go. So if it's tons of heat, I'm going to need a bigger ring. Yep. If I have a bigger ring and I have a lot of cylinder pressure, there's a lot more force against the cylinder wall I'm trying to deal with. Okay. So I need more oil to control that and lubricate it. Okay. I also mentioned that it was a methanol powered engine. And typically in methanol versus gas, we're going to have two or two and a half times more fuel volume. Right. Right. So that means that methanol, what it's trying to do is wash the oil off the cylinder wall that Absolutely. I so desperately need for my ring. Right. So my actual crosshatch depth and, and you know, pattern of my peaks, my core and my valley, those values are drastically different on a 
turbo or a blown methanol engine than they would be, say, on a, a, I don't know, a naturally aspirated or a small displacement engine that doesn't make as much power and has smaller rings. So massively different profile required to control that. I can see the actual angle of the hone inside this bore uh -huh. here. Yeah. How do I actually know that the machine gave me what I asked? Yeah, so that's a good question, because obviously the machine's a CNC and it's a perfect robot and all right. that. So we type in, hey, you know what? I want a 28 degree. How do I know I got that? Well, it's every chance I just fat fingered that. That's exactly really right. 38 or something. Or 82. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't be the so, first time. So uh, actually there's a really inexpensive tool that Total Seal makes, this little plastic credit card looking thing that uh, you can call them up and you know they'll, they'll sell one or give, I don't know how they do it here, but basically all it is is it's a little bit hard to see probably on camera because it's clear. It's like a protractor. It, it's like a protractor, it's got angles on it. So you just take this thing and you lay it in there in your cylinder bore like that and e even with the top and now you can sort of look in there oh, and I see, which, see yeah, which angle. Yeah, so what would you say, what do we got there? And remember that's the that's, half angle, so you double that. Yeah, so it's like 15, so you're on 30 degrees in the Right about 30 degrees, yeah, and that's pretty much what we had in our machine. So. Yeah. Pretty cool. So that's a neat little tool you can get to. If you can't measure something, how do you know if it is what you even think it is and how do you know if it's better or worse, right? So we like typically- a friend of mine once uh, said, if you can't measure it, how do you manage it? You can't manage it, that's right. So we typically send our students home with one of these in their pocket, you know. That's so, cool. Yeah, pretty neat little thing. What's the most dangerous mistake that people can make when tuning an engine? Hmm, that's, a, that's a good one. So you know, uh, a lot of my career, uh, while I was doing engine development and EFI tuning and even the school, I was also heavily involved in professional aviation and, and also as a flight instructor. And one of the things that, that we talk about in aviation, because it's such a high risk thing, is when things are going along that aren't what you expected, you get an urge to do something, just do anything, as long as you do something. Right. And that can be a real problem in tuning, whether it's, I don't have enough data to understand what just happened, so I'm just gonna, let me just try throwing fuel at it or leaning it out or try some more timing. That experimentation mentality can lead to success, but more often leads to sorrow because you make a mistake that you didn't even know you're making because you didn't have the data. So, you know, guys always want to do what's easiest and what's cheapest. So I want to road tune without an O2 sensor, without a knock sensor, you know, something silly like that. It's really more of a behavioral mistake than a procedural one, you know, but ultimately, you know, the data allows us to make good decisions and without measuring something, we can't really manage it and make it better. And I think for me, that's probably one of the, the biggest pet peeves that I have for the school is don't just run off and press buttons and do something because it will likely end in tragedy. Good call. Well, Ben, thank you for the knowledge bombs. Sure. Where can people find you online and around the world? Uh, we're pretty well all over the place. Uh, we have EFI101.com as our website. We have uh, Facebook, we have Instagram, we have YouTube, and all of those are EFI University. So the easiest way is just type in a Google search and you'll, you'll find us pretty easily there. So. Well, Ben from EFI University, thanks for having us. You're welcome. Thanks Matt for having me. from Haltech. See you next time. See you guys.